All right, ladies. We're going to try this. This is kind of too tall, but I feel like I can read it better. I, I raised it real quick because, yeah, I'm short. Um, uh, actually, will somebody dig for, Tina, will you dig for, uh, I think in the inside pocket there's a white. Would you mind wiping those? So don't make us take even longer. Okay. So, hello. I want to say this real quick so that I don't forget. Come ready next week. To, um, I will soon be going to uh, Croatia and London, and so most of you have, uh, most of you know uh, Ryan and Amanda Teeson, and most of you have at least met. So Ryan and Amanda, for those who don't know, are our kind of like church replanters in London. So they took over a church that has long since not been growing, and they're working to see the Lord build that congregation. And they've had a lot of really great things happening over this past year. Um, but Kevin and I have only spent, I think it was like four hours with them and over two years since, two years since they went. Mm -hmm. um, that's all we had when we went through by the time everything happened the way it happened. And so we're going to spend a couple of days encouraging them. Kevin and Ryan will have a lot of meetings. Um, and then we'll be going to Croatia. So many of you met Irena and Yvonne who were here from Croatia. He is a church, well, he's a pastor there. But he's also working toward church plants. He has three different mission locations where they send guys to, to minister to people in that area and to hold Bible studies and things like that, that their prayer is to one day see um, plant churches in those spots. And so Croatia is very, uh, very lost. It's, I think it's less than 2%. If, or is it less than 1%? Do you remember, Gina? I think it's like 1%. One. One. Yeah, yeah, 1% Christian, like evangelical Christian. So predominantly they all identify Catholic, um, but they don't have any actual practice of any faith really at all. Um, so they're, they're basically agnostic, but title themselves Catholic. But Okay, so anyways, we're going, and I thought it would be fun, because I didn't have to do the work, and Shirley Waite made us a bunch of beautiful cards. So next week, Shirley has made us all kinds of different handmade cards for Irena and um, for Amanda Thiessen. So next week when you come, I want each of you to be able to write a note. And even if you've never met them, just imagine that they are in dark places because the gospel is not prevalent there, though we know it's just as powerful there. And so we're asking the Lord to do a work um, through their lives in those places. But if you'll come ready to write a little prayer and a note to them and sign it from yourself, and then we're going to take that with a few different little gifts that I've been gathering up. Uh, Alicia Richardson made them each, uh, them and their daughter, a little jewelry satchel thing that's super cute. She's one of our quilters. And um, some different things. So if there's just something you want to add to the care package, I plan to pack lightly other than, and I'm already bringing Yvonne and Irena love every time they're here. And when we go there, we bring them uh, the Coffee Mate Horribly Unhealthy Creamers. <laughs> um, I put like three or four of my bags. They just absolutely love them and she'll like, she'll salvage them for as long as she can in her fridge there. So, um, so if there's anything you just want to bless them with, feel free to, to bring that next week and I'll find a way to get it into mine or maybe Kevin's even in case would be better. Um, so if y'all will be praying for them and then come ready to do that, we should have a card for each of you that's handmade. They're really beautiful. All them. She made several different kinds so that they wouldn't get all the same from all of us. So thank you, Shirley, very much for that, for using your giftedness in that way. Okay, so on that note, um, how many of you know what an influencer is <laughs> in our day, right? So tell me something about, like, where are influencers? Where do you see them? Social media, Social media TikTok, YouTube. YouTube. What else did y'all say? Instagram. Instagram. And even, I mean, Hollywood, right? Even Hollywood actors and actresses in general are becoming, you know, well, they kind of always were, but now there's this new title that we have for influencers. Well, yeah, and, yeah, and maybe some politicians that we don't want to be influencing. Um, okay, so one of the things that many influencers are dealing with in our day uh, that they have to add time into their schedule for is the frustration of uh, what they're now, they've actually titled them imposter accounts, right? And so there's accounts that are made that have their, that bear their name and sometimes we'll have their image or usually have their image on this account, right? And so they actually have to put time into their week to deal with the, managing the issue of 
if they're much of an influencer at all, they are spending some amount of time or paying staff to spend time dealing with managing the issue and maintenancing the issue of these imposter accounts. Well, one of the, they do real damage, right? To their accounts. And so there's a difference between the imposter accounts and fan pages. So if you put in Britney Spears on Google, you'll come across different fan pages that you can follow to different social media sites that will say Britney Spears or any other influencer. I just came across that one today, so I thought I would mention that one. Not because I'm a super fan or something. So <laughs> if you follow that though, you'll see her image and you'll see her name. But once you get into that bio, immediately stated clearly under her name is fan page. So they're identifying themselves as not an imposter, but a fan page. This is what I'm doing. I'm under this image. I'm under this name, but I am not actually portraying myself as Britney Spears. Okay. And so, um, they, this, they have to take certain steps to deal with these issues of these, uh, imposters that to gather their evidence, right. And they have to report the user and then they set out to really pump into their fan base for these, for them to be aware of them but also for their fans to now report it as well, because it's really difficult to get it dealt with fully unless you have a lot of action and conversation happening about these uh, fake accounts, right? And so it's a frustration that they're having to deal with. I want us tonight, as we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want us to remember the words of Jesus himself in Matthew 7, who says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Let's open in prayer. Father God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for every opportunity we get to open your word. And as we'll be reminded of in this chapter, that as we do, every time we do, it is breathed out by you, inspired of you. And we praise you for that and praise you for the work that you do in our lives. Um, we ask that through this passage um, and as we continue to study that you would make us more and more authentic and who we are as we portray you and more aware of what we need to be doing to guard ourselves in jesus holy and precious name amen amen, amen. okay so the first stop i want to make is beware of the godless imposter for they make great godly impersonators so what's the difference between an imposter and an impersonator or first let's start with who are some impersonations that you've seen People you've seen impersonating someone else. Maybe you've gone to Branson, I know many of you, and there's been impersonators of certain people. Who are some, some people you've seen impersonated? Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson? Elvis. Elvis? <laughs> Was the Michael Jackson as good of an answer as Michael Jackson? They're pretty good. They're pretty good? Okay. Not as good, but pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Elvis, Michael Jackson, Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. <laughs> Some of the classics, right? Yeah. Those are those are kind of the main, like those three you're going to see like at Disney World or different places. Like these are some of the people that are always going to be portrayed. So um, they make, so what's the difference between them and an actual imposter? They're trying to make you believe they are who. Mm -hmm. They are who they're portraying yeah. to be. Yeah. Okay. I want to look. Did y'all notice? A lot of lists happening in this chapter yeah. there's several different lists right and so I want us to first talk about what well, we're gonna talk about three <coughs> things that these imposters typically possess they're utterly godless they're predatory and they're anti truth so on the utterly godless I think that's what he's giving us with this whole section with his the section with his list of for people will be lovers. Okay, let's read. Let's read one through three real quick. But understand this: that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pre pleasure rather than lovers of God. And having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. That sounds utterly godless. And so this list on the board is all of these characteristics. Characteristics. So the first few commentators that I had looked into after I'd been in this for 
um, because of course I went through it in the summer and then came back to it a couple weeks ago and had been in it all week this week. I felt like when I was reading this list, I felt like he was stating all these things. I saw 18 characteristics and then a characteristic that was universal to all of them. Many of the commentators that I started looking into, I started last week in commentators, and many of them were stating 19 characteristics. I think this is 18 characteristics, and I did find some that were solid uh, commentators that thought the same, so I was like, okay, I think, I'm, I think I'm right about this. But I think that it's these 18 things, and then um, down here, they're utterly, or, or they're, uh, they have the appearance of godliness, so the form of it, but denying its power. I think it's saying, these people, whatever ones of things that these that they are that they portray, they are all they all have the appearance of godliness, but they're denying its power. So these are people he's speaking of within their congregations who claim Christ, right? These are not people outside the church walls. These are people inside the church of God who are proclaiming that and confessing that they are a thing when they're actually not. They have the form of the thing, but they're not the thing. They may look like Michael Jackson, and they may sort of talk and walk and act like Michael Jackson, but they ain't got all the moves because they ain't Michael Jackson, right? So um, I think that's what's happening here. And so I wrote out for you the Greek words just because I thought there were some interesting parts about that that we'll talk about. So these are all the Greek words. Now, arrogant for some reason, I don't know if it just wasn't as... Uh, I just couldn't find the Greek one for that. So I don't know if somebody... I don't know why in that particular passage this word was just, I just kept getting the word arrogant. So, um, for whatever reason. Uh, and then this was a really interesting word, blasphemoi, or obviously where we get our word blasphemous, was what was the translation for abuse. And I thought that was interesting. Um, but on one thing I want you to notice is all these ones with A, which I forgot to come and put. Not this one. So this one. I forgot the green slash there. So these all have, uh, make sure what I'm, okay, so yeah, all these A's, I have it here for you. The prefix means they're absent of or void of, completely empty of a thing, okay? And so they're, they're uh, let's start up here. So self-centered and narcissistic, is that something you feel like is growing in our days? Because he says in verse 1, understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. And I think he's saying, why is there going to be times of difficulty? For people will be all this. Therefore, life is difficult. Life is hard to live in when this is who you're living among, right? So self-centered and narcissistic. Now, who, who isn't narcissistic? To some degree, because we are in our flesh, our own flesh, our own self-interest is constantly something that we'll have to battle, I believe. On this side of heaven but this has a sense of people who are literally only concerned with self right so I, I've been listening to a man who is a author and um, I think he's a scholar now and he has his own story of coming out of the LGBTQ and when he was in it that that was all the initials there was um, and he talks about just how narcissistic that world is because they've been trained by the culture and by their own sin nature to think only about their, like they see the whole world through either their biology or their sexuality, right? And when you do that, it's, it's like it's a trap to self-thinking, self-centeredness. So this is a growing trend, obviously, in these uh, last days that we're in. But what are the last days? These last days that it's speaking about. Mm -hmm. So it's all the days from uh, post-resurrection uh, uh, and Christ's second coming. So we are in the last days, and we have been in the last days. So I don't think it's helpful to get super concerned with when the end time itself, like the day and the hour is going to be, um, and to decide, oh, well, now that, so, like, let's just say a candidate makes it into the White House that you absolutely are praying does not make it into the White House. If they do, you cannot plummet and believe that now the end is tomorrow. Like, we are all going to die, and we have to be concerned with the end times even more than we ever have been. I don't think we're supposed to be concerned with the end times. I think we're 
we're to be concerned about what's happening within the body of believers and how we are pursuing the lost in the end times, right? Okay, so then you have, I can't really say these. Anybody really good at saying Greek words? If you are, jump in. I would love for you to say them. So, Pilar Gore, lovers of money. So they love money. Um, so this is even just from the, the lowest of the, the issue of money loving can just be, uh, and, and it's not any lower in the life of a regular old guy than it is in somebody who is a billionaire, but just the need to constantly work to make it up the next rung of the ladder to make more money to get the bigger house, to get the fancier car, that's a lover of money, and it can still their growth and their walk with the Lord just for that, just like that. Okay, so arrogant, obviously the outward manifestation of inward pride, and then we said blasphemy, abusive, and I didn't have time to do a deeper dive on because this is this is very strange to me is it to y'all mm -hmm. like that that would be you know so i wanted to go further on that and i ran out of time um so then here's your absent of a pythos no parental obedience within so they were absolutely void of the ability to obey their parents right they're not even capable of doing it um our our caris toy now does anybody recognize Probably you already saw this root word here, charis. So charis means, it's, so the root word of this word is charis, grace, kindness, and life is the meaning of that. So that's what that word is. And there's a book that I, um, if you're good with flowery writing, which if I'm in the right mood, I really enjoy it. And if I'm not, then I don't. But there's a book called uh, 1,000 Gifts. Has anybody read that? Um, what is her name? The author, A Thousand Gifts and Anne The Broken Way, Ann Voskamp. Yeah, we were talking about that this weekend, weren't we? Ann Voskamp. Um, she's a great writer. Uh, so the whole time you're reading or listening on Audible, you're seeing a, a picture, right? Because she's just painting a picture the whole time. But she has a great book about uh, A Thousand Gifts, and she talks a lot about this, Cara's Grace. Um, okay, so, and Noi Soy, Absent of Holiness. So they're literally void of holiness. I'm not going to try to say more. Y'all can see them. Y'all can say Y'all can <laughs> phonetically try it just as well as I can. Um, so they're without love. This literal trans translation of, of that word is heartless. And the only other place it's used in the whole New Testament is uh, Romans 131. And I think Gina has, are you the one that has it? Or Paula has that pulled up for us. I'm going to take the wrong one, sorry. That's okay. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Did I read that right? Mm hmm. Yeah. So that sounds similar to this this definition for sure, right? Um, without even the ability to do, and they, there's a lot of was there a couple of words you used that were un unmerciful, that, yeah, uh, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same but have pleasure in pleasure in them that do them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. What is that? is that King James? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. Then, uh, so I just thought that was interesting. Like we mentioned last week or sometime recently, the times that it would be, like, this is very interesting, right? So I would, I would spend more time trying to figure out, just so that I could understand what he was really meaning by this word in that particular text. And then here, if there's only one other place in the scripture that it's used, like, I typically want to go a deeper dive on that, right? Um, okay, so then Astorgoi. With the, okay, we did that one. Sorry, that's that one. Asponoya, whatever. <laughs> Void of forgiveness without ability to forgive. Okay, this one's interesting. Um, Daboloi, usually translated as devil. But it's used here with the root meaning slanderous. But where do, what word do we get in our language from that? Diabolical. You're diabolical. That's what Kevin told Ari this week for sending us a picture <laughs> 
of a chocolate lab puppy. <laughs> Kevin had told her, Kevin had told her, I can't have a puppy unless his name is Thomas. He like randomly named, I'm like, you're speaking things into life. Um, and so he said, yeah. So she texts a picture of a chocolate lab puppy with a big sign that says, hi, my name is Thomas. <laughs> the puppies won't be re ready until mid-November, but guess who we met last night? Thomas. Oh. So, um, he said, you are diabolical using your children. That's what he, oh, because that's what it was. Then she sent a video. Like, that was bad enough. Then she sent a video of Stetson holding the puppy and calling it Thomas. <laughs> now, last night she told us he was, they walked outside and he was calling that puppy Thomas before she videoed. <laughs> so, okay. So, this word means without self-control. This one means untamed without civility. So, like, they're literally feral, right? No civilized nature within them. They're just wild and feral. Uh, this, we, oh, we didn't pull those up. So, that's several passages where you can find that same word. Um, then, pro means that they're, they're indicating an aggressive inclination towards a thing. And so, these words follow that. Uh, this one is disposed towards betrayal disposed towards recklessness, and then this conceited is literal trans translation is puffed up, so big-headed, right? Don't give me a big head. That's the idea there. And then philodoni, loving pleasure rather than a love for God, which Romans kind of pointed to as well. And then this morphosin is the having the form of our outward shape only used here and then like in Romans 2.20. Did we have that one? Jamie has that one. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have the law and the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Is that the right one? Romans, Romans 2.20. 220. Yeah, do it one more time. Okay. It says, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So the embodiment mm -hmm. is the word. So you're embodying knowledge and truth. But there it's on a positive. Right, they're actually embodying knowledge and truth, and, and here looked, it's being used. I looked up last one, boy. It says abusive language. Ah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Much more sense. Okay, so this is the list of the eighteen things that I think he then is saying. These people have the appearance of godliness, but deny its power. What do y'all think? Is happening there with that phrase the appearance of godliness but deny its power the deny its power part they're impersonating someone they're impersonating they're trying to is it kind of like when they're trying to put more things on works versus denying the power yeah so they're focusing it's on a free gift. your works instead of the gift yeah that means like void of the spirit and the spirit is the power yeah deny its power so I was thinking probably somewhere in the middle of all this. Um, when I was looking into it, I think there's this sense of they're living like this. They're, though they're trying to portray this outward appearance of godliness. They're denying that very godliness by not allowing it to transform anything within them. So that metamorphosis, which is what this word makes us think of, right? because um, it's from that root, that, that's not able to happen because they're denying the power of the word, they're denying the power of the spirit, of that true godliness to do any kind of transformation in their life. So there's no power in their godliness. And our study is called what? Godliness with, godliness with power. And so we're called to that life of actually walking in power. And I think he's laying out why they're not, <coughs> how they're not able to do so. Okay. So they're utterly godless, and then they appear godly. So they look, talk, walk, sing, and act the part of the godly one among us. I think from Jesus' words in Matthew and another section in Matthew and several other places in the New Testament, in the Gospels particularly, we should not, we're told and warned over and over to be aware that there are going to be imposters. We've already hit that, I think, several times in our study so far. This is week nine. Are we on, and I think we probably talked about false teachers or false prophets or these type of imposters, I would say probably five, five times, five weeks of our discussion that's been somewhere within our discussion. 
And so we shouldn't be surprised when somebody who sings in the praise team and has beautiful, perfect children and, um, you know, teaches Sunday school or teaches an institute class or a Wednesday night class, like we should not be like jaw dropping. What? They're a sinner? Like, <laughs> why, why does that continue to surprise us? Except that we're not really that real with ourselves about our own sin nature. Because if we're real with ourselves about our own sin nature, we know it only takes one failure, one willingness to cave to temptation to wind up in a world of hurt and a world of sin. Okay, so um, anybody have a story without names of somebody who this has? And I, and I don't want to, because we grow in our, in our walk with the Lord. We grow in our discernment. We grow in our understanding. But have you been shocked? because I think we all have somewhere, somehow, by somebody in the past who has lived a certain way in front of people and has turned out to be an imposter. Anybody want to share any story without names? A pastor that okay. we had. Um, and when it got so bad that we finally had to confront, really confront, uh -huh. brought his lawyer with him. Wow. And he wanted that anything that had been said against him not be allowed to be let out right and the the body of deacons looked at him and said where do you think we got this from yeah if we didn't get it from the people in the and he finally did agree to leave but it was a very contentious and the signs were there not at first i think mm -hmm. for a lot of people it depended on how you know, how much you were around and how much you gleaned. Yeah. But it was a very hurtful, awful time. And it's hard. It's hard to be. I feel like in a day right now, which we've talked about before in our class, where so many large church pastors who are solid, theologically sound, thriving congregations that they're leading, who wind up in moral sin issues and have to leave their entire ministry and it craters around them. It's devastating. And then other like seminary professors that are <coughs> dropping like flies here and there with all kinds of different things happening in their lives. And I think, I don't know, I think that it's a, it's a fine line or a tight rope we kind of have to walk as believers who are discerning to be very discerning because the scripture tells us over and over we're to welcome or to draw people in, and one of the things we've seen God do more than anything he's done at Cana is to open their arms and love whoever walks through the door. <coughs> I believe that today, almost nobody could shock the majority of Cana bad enough that they would not walk straight up to the person and love them and invite them in and make sure that they're not alone and help them get where they need to be. That's the kind of people Cana has, God has made Cana to be, okay? However, in being loving and open and kind and welcoming, the scripture never condones that we be a people who are mindless and undiscerning and unwilling to call things what they are and to be aware that there are imposters among us. You picture yourself as part of the watch team. So our watch team does an excellent job of making sure we're safe. They're at all the doors, they're walking the, the, the halls all the time. They're making sure everything is tended and taken care of. And they're pretty intense about it. There has been some Sundays quite a few years ago um, when there was a bit of a stir up enough that our watch team was concerned. And every time I turned around, there was a watchman directly next to me, like stationed everywhere I went, there would be a watchman, right? And so um, it's kind of it was kind of unsettling in a lot of ways, but just they are they are ready to protect the congregation. We have to see ourselves as believers as part of that spiritual watch team. It doesn't mean so that's where the fine line is. Because we can't become cynical, because I can promise you, in 25 years now, 27 years of marriage, 26 years of ministry, that is that is a daily, at least weekly, effort that ministers have to put to death. That I'm not going to be cynical. I'm not going to assume just because so many church people have done so many things, just like church people can't say, just because so many pastors have failed so many times, I'm not going to trust the pastor, I'm not going to trust my congregation. I'm going to build a wall and isolate myself because all these things have happened to us in the last 26 years of ministry. 
I would for I mean I would I would crater obviously I couldn't I couldn't handle not having people in my life but it is a it's a risk we have to take every time to trust somebody so we can't stop taking the risk but we also can't just as soon as somebody walks through the door be like you you just seem really gifted at A B or C like you should go be a part of this or you should go start teaching a Sunday school class or you should we're big on getting people involved and serving very quickly. We don't want there to be six months to a year to two years before people who come to Cana are active in some way, serving in somewhere, right, in some place. But we have to be really wise about where and when and how we do those things. So we have to be aware of the godly, imp the godless imposter, for they make great godly impersonators. Okay, so they're utterly godless, but they appear godly. They seem like they're really legit. And then they're predatory. So that's the... That's the third one, predatory. It was the second one. Uh, appear godly. Utterly godless, but appear godly. And they are predatory. So in verse 6, let's read, uh, let's read verse 5 and 6. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying his power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions. What what comes to mind for you guys in that in that verse particularly? Verse six. Huh? Do what? Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, actual physical harm. The creeping part into your house. Yeah. 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 What else? Like desperate housewives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's yeah that really does it's the it's the desperate housewives of the church right um and do you what chapter were we on in first timothy where it talked about the women uh got up what was that word i used it was a fun word gadabouts they were going from house to house gossiping right so it's probably the same group of women i would think or at least a similar group of women who are weak-minded they're in their homes, apparently in the middle of the day, they, they don't have time, they got plenty of time on their hands, and this is how they're spending it. And these women, and many men do this too, are so anxious to jump from thought to thought, theology to theology, doctrine to doctrine, whatever the new fancy thing is, that's what they're, they're willing to listen to. And so this, this predatory nature, they go to the spiritually weak-minded and the physically vulnerable. So we're in that point of two, the physically vulnerable. Um, I think this is particularly dealing with the spiritual, so the, the mindedness of the thing, um, more than the physical, but at the same time, a man is, can be a, very intimidating, even if he's just talking to this woman who's already weak-minded about things of the spirit, spiritual things, he's still going to have a sense of physical intimidation in her house. And why do you think they're sneaking? Why are they creeping in? Because they're guilty. They're guilty. They know what they're doing. They're hiding. So, and again, because I think we're talking about the context of a church body, there are, I mean, any pastor you may meet that's been in ministry 15 or 20 years, unless it was a church plant, then he has a little bit less chance of this happening. But we know a pastor who planted a church and, and he was there 20 years, but the third year in, this type of thing specifically happened to them. Um, so most ministers face this at some point where there are people I picture and I've always pictured it this way creeping in sneaking into houses inviting people over to their houses to talk about or go into their homes to talk against the pastor so they're they're planning meetings on church campuses that's happened to us before when we weren't there there, there was a meeting at the church and the pastor wasn't invited you know like that kind of stuff this is for some reason like such a like a juicy tidbit that just so hard to resist, right? But it's not just about ministers. They're, however, oftentimes we see the apostle kind of pointing to this idea of they're preaching something else. They're teaching something else. They're anti-truth. In fact, that's our final spot that we're going to jump to in this part um, is anti-truth. So these people are utterly godless. They appear godly. They're predatory and they're anti-truth. They oppose the truth so naturally it makes sense that they prey on those who seem ready to jump from this doctrine to doctrine. Whatever a fancy new help book is out there, whatever fancy new teacher, 
um, is on the TV or on the radio. We're listening so that it can tickle our ears. And sometimes the motivation doesn't start with, I don't actually want to hear the words of God, right? Sometimes the motivation is, this is really exciting. Like, this sounds really good. Like, the health and wealth doctrine can pull people in because it sounds really great. If I do good things and I give my money, my life gets better. My life gets easier. Okay, but what do you see about these people? What's going to happen to them? They will not get very far. So did you see the truth? I didn't jump back to the truth. So the anti-truth, let me jump back there. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Tracy, yes. I pastored that when I was young. Over probably 30 years or so as a pastor of the uh -huh. church, church. But then when he retired, he became drunk. Oh, that hurt. Yeah. That, that hurt bad. My mother even went to him and had to <coughs> baptize her again because mm -hmm. she was failing in health mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, and then he did that when he yeah. retired. Yeah. So That's so he, hard. He did have a disabled son. And, but, and I, yeah. It, he was, a, I mean, he was a good man. Yeah. 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 And that's what I, I never, that's why even when I started out, I continued to go back to, like, we're shocked that these people fail and do what they do, yeah. but they are humans. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly if they're a, a senior pastor who actually loves his congregation, they're bearing the weight. News came in today that is weighty, right? On every <laughs> member of the congregation, there's this constant influx of information and news and struggle and trial for everybody in their congregation, right? And they're doing what they can to take it and lay it before the Lord, but it is weighty stuff. So it does not excuse any immorality, but I think if they're not really careful and really wise and really aware of their own weaknesses and really pay attention to their physical, spiritual, emotional health themselves, as they're pouring out and pouring out and pouring out for 30 years at this church, at the end, when they look back, oftentimes they can't see the spiritual ramifications for the physical 30 years of work that they put in. And it can be really discouraging. And they can end really poorly. Yeah. Tracy, I was just going to say, like, what you've alluded to several times, that these, all these things are in us to some extent, in all of us. And none of us, none of us is above a fall. Like, we're all equally as capable of any sin that the person that we all, you know, admired and fell and it was a big thing. Like, we're all equally capable of that. And I've actually been thinking about this recently, like um, why that is. And I think one factor is accountability. And particularly when people write, like are in leadership positions, we admire them. And probably, you could probably speak to, people don't ask questions, right? Like if there's something that might be concerning in your life, then people are probably not going to challenge you on it, right? But also the same is true for like within the body, we so often are just like, it's not my place to say anything that doesn't seem right, but it's not my place. But we need each other because we're all just as capable. Like, I mean, our, our pastors and our leaders and teachers and one another, we have to be there for each other and we have to be willing to even be persecuted within the body i think yeah. like by having those hard conversations that nobody wants to bring up something but it's like a fight for life right like yeah. we're all trying to help each other get to the finish line and there's so many temptations and allures away from that like we we need each other to have those and truly need mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know what the bible doesn't say except for teachers pastors and leaders mm -hmm. it no. says all have sinned and fall mm -hmm. short mm -hmm. of the glory of god yeah i mean it says everybody yeah yeah that's true yeah. 
Yeah. So it was, I was going to say something. I think it's, I think it's because we as human beings, or specifically <coughs> myself, can't begin to grasp how much God loves us, yeah. how, how much he understands our weaknesses. Uh, the thing in Moms and Mentors, this mm -hmm. past chapter, was so good to me because yeah. it spoke about uh, the weaknesses that we all have and the fact that sometimes we get hung up on them. Of, Why can't I get past this? You know, and it's like, God doesn't care. Yeah. The, he made us top to bottom. He knows our insecurities. He knows where our faults are. And we are not all that, mm -hmm. you know. And, and he loves us with such an intimate, precious, I, it's indescribable kind of love because we don't know how that is yeah. in our human form. And and he's just standing there with open arms. And, and we are so quick um, to see those faults and weaknesses in other people mm -hmm. and not so much in ourselves. We believe him for grace, for salvation, but that everyday grace you know, Lord, as I'm going to the store, help me not kill the people in front of me. You know, <laughs> they're cutting me Amen. off. You know, it's it's those kinds of things that mm -hmm. that rob us of uh, a, an even greater walk with Him. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's hard to have this again balance of understands God understanding God's justice. I mean, because these these characteristics He's pointing out this absent of holiness, right? He, he's not, Paul's not stating these as neutral, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is being called out. This is sinful. And so keeping that balance of understanding the unholiness and the sin nature that we bear within ourselves and that others bear within them, but allowing it to be the love of Christ or the kindness of God that leads one to repentance. Instead, we often turn toward condemnation or turning away from or distancing ourselves from this person. So like Melody talked about, it is a true need. There are people right now in our congregation, they know that Kevin and I have to reach out. That's how a lot of times people see it, that the pastor and wife, like they got to reach out because they're them. But they need, they need the congregation pressing in when they haven't seen them in six weeks. Particularly if they know that the spouse has some issue with something that's wreaking havoc on their home or some child is in some dire situation sinfully, I mean, and it's breaking the family's heart, like the body of Christ, you guys have a bigger impact often on reaching out to people in your congregation than the leadership can. We, we will do it and we will do it until we die. And we want to do it. We don't just do it because of our title. We did this when we were in the youth group. This was part of who we always were. But there's something different that happens when it's the body of Christ taking care of the body of Christ. And I see that being a growing thing, too, in our congregation. I think one of the evidences was this last weekend with our, with our marriage weekend. Each of the other years, not in a bad way, but Kevin and I felt more like we had to help connect couples to couples and, like, make sure people were feeling engaged and being engaged, you know, kind of thing. This week, this last Wednesday or weekend, whatever it was, literally, upon walking through the doors, everybody just loved. They just connected. There was no sense of anybody. I did not see any awkward silence. I didn't see anybody standing by themselves. I mean, it was just like a beautiful thing. That was one of the things that we were so grateful to see last weekend. Um, somebody had me, Paula. Well, I was just going to say, I reached out to somebody. That I haven't, someone that used to come pretty regularly uh -huh. that uh, haven't seen her. Right. And it was just a text message. Yeah. And she replied back to me, and she said, you just don't know how much that means to me that you've reached yeah. out. So yeah. sometimes just a text yep. message saying we miss you yep. or something like that can really exactly. go a long way. And then to the idea of people walk, like that are in a sin struggle, if you know, if you see it's <coughs> evident that they're walking in sin, it is not loving to just pretend like it's fine. Like That's not helping them. So, yeah, maybe going up and calling them in love to accountability, hey, I, I noticed that you're struggling with this, or I see your social media posts lately, and it looks like there's a lot of alcohol back on the table, like, you know, whatever it is, um, I want to walk with you. Like, if that's something you're wanting to get hold of, to get a hold of in your life, I'm here. 
I want to I want to do it with you. I'll do I'll I'll abstain from something else. Let's do something to get you closer, one step closer to freedom than you are today. And it yeah, maybe they leave. Maybe they remove themselves from your relationship. But if you actually love them, they know that you love them. People know when they're just being condemned and people know when they're being loved and called out in love. And they might get upset and they might leave, but they will remember if they ever get to the point where they're truly ready to turn, they'll remember someone reached out and tried to influence me in this way and they might come back around to you, right? And so um, then people who are coming out of a life of sin, they come into a congregation, the loneliest day they will ever experience is Sunday. They will come to church, particularly if they're single. So it's obviously, I know we talk about it a lot, but it's a growing pattern right now to see people going into the LGBTQT, blah, 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 initials, and then later coming out of it and walking into churches and not even being loved or sat by or <coughs> talked to or any other thing. So there's going to continue to be refugees coming back away from these lifestyles, trying to find wholeness and healing in churches, and they won't find it in many, many, many churches. So remembering people who are single on Sundays is huge. Remembering people in your congregation that are single, coming away from sin or not. It is a lonely place to be in a world, and particularly churches, built around family. And as it should be, because we have to pass it on to the next generation. But we as believers need to have our eyes open and our hearts open to those who are coming alone. Have any of you had to come to church a lot alone? Annette's had to because her <laughs> husband's job, right? So he's a police officer, and oftentimes she and, and Janice's husband has to work out of town almost the whole year, right? So she's had to learn what it's like to come alone. If you understand that and you see other people coming alone, go sit by them, you know? Even if it's not the seat you always sit in, like get up, <laughs> go join them because you know what it feels like. You don't want to sit by us. us. <laughs> huh? You don't want to sit by us. My child is a mess. Oh, they would love to sit by Lander because he's not there, so they're not going to be stressed about it. I was a widow for six years. Oh, yeah. That's a tough It is. Even people that you've <laughs> known forever and you're just, you it, just feel alone. just out. It changes it's everything. Very, it, 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 it teaches you a lot. Yeah. about the way you treated people and how you ought to. Yeah. And it's something that, again, if we see someone alone, yeah, for whatever Don't reason. Don't let them say that way. They need you. Like Melody said, they need each other. We need each other. Okay, yeah. so let's go to number the point number two. So apparently we need to speed up. Okay, so the next point is become the expert, expose the imposter. Become the expert, expose the imposter. Let's read verses 10 through... Let's read 10 through 14. Yeah, and then we'll kind of go back and forth. <clears throat> you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at, at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have to follow the authentic men and women that God puts in our lives. If there's somebody that seems a step ahead of you at all in their walk with Christ, follow that. Follow their teaching, their aim, and they're going to fail. So don't put them in a, on a pedestal. Keep the reality check ever present, but do the things they do. Because yes, they're sinners too, but there are things that they're portraying that are godly that shows a maturity that you've not yet come to. Follow those patterns. What are the things that he says that, that Paul says that Timothy followed? Yes, the persecutions and sufferings and the aim in life. Yep. So in that, so he, he follows all of these things. Oh, I'm going to come back to that. <coughs> okay, so he's following these things and then he's bearing with them in their suffering. So he's not just following all the good things. 
I thought it was interesting how he did mention all the good things, and then Melody, Melody at the end threw in there his sufferings, right? That's not something we really want to follow. But Timothy was willing to follow Paul into persecutions and into his sufferings. So he didn't watch Paul being persecuted and suffer over there. He came and he sat with Paul in his persecution and in his suffering and chose to suffer, right? Okay. So bearing with him and their bearing with them in their sufferings, verses ten through thirteen. In that section, he talks about these persecutions, and he and he says, "Who will, who's going to suffer from persecution?" <coughs> yep. Who in here desires to live a godly life? Doesn't mean you've attained it, but you desire. You're going to face persecution. And Melody pointed out, sorry, Melody, to keep like pointing you out about what you pointed out, but this idea of even within the church to be willing to be persecuted to a degree, even in your own congregation. When something's happening that you know is not right, being willing to be the awkward one that has to say something to someone. We've experienced this even within, I hate to say it, but a group of pastors and wives where we have really struggled to understand where God would have us go with that relationship because there are things that just shouldn't be discussed, things that shouldn't be said, really anywhere, but particularly in mixed company with wives and husbands and things of that nature. And so if we make a decision that we're struggling with seeking the Lord on making, I feel like this will be a type of persecution that we have to face because I know I know what will likely come from that, right? <coughs> And so it's, it's heartbreaking, and you don't want to have to make those confrontations or experience those persecutions. But, I mean, what else? To whom else would we go? Like, if we can't follow Christ in something like that, like what they're going to say about us, then are we going to follow Christ if we're actually under physical persecutions, under threat of our family's lives? That's not likely, right? Okay. Um so if you've known them to if you've known these people in your life to be honorable and faithful, don't allow yourself to be to pull back from them or distance yourself from them <coughs> when they're being persecuted. Instead, press into them and minister to them in their hurt. You have to press into those who you see being persecuted or maligned or slandered. If you know them to be honorable, don't let yourself shrink back in fear from identifying with them. Right? Like, that's exactly who we should be identifying with. And the more we do that in our congregation, the more we have that unity and that love of the Spirit that's among us. Okay, the third point on this section, so we have follow the authentic men and women in your life, bear with them in their sufferings, and then solidify your aim and count the cost. Solidify your aim and count your cost. So back in verse 10, he said, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life. What do you think he's pointing to there? Thinking about in the past chapter when he gave like the analogy of the soldier that uh, aimed to please the one mm -hmm. who enlisted him. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to do the, like the aim, yeah. like a, a, a soldier with a bow and arrow. But yes. Yeah. Who he's looking to please. His aim in life is to follow Christ, to, to honor the Lord. Anything else? Any other thoughts? Yeah, he got into the purpose that yeah. Paul had set out and was a part of it. So those of you who were at marriage weekend, Kevin talked about vision. So visioning, Kevin has a definition that, that and I won't get it right, but to have a vision for the future <coughs> is to picture life in that place to experience what it will feel like. So if you're wanting to, if you're wanting to look three to five years down the road at an ideal vision, then you're picturing what, what's happening around you. Who are the people? What's the chair like you're in? Um, is there a chocolate puppy named Thomas at your feet, which he did mention in his vision last weekend? Um, not by name, but... So you're, you're picturing what that would feel like. And so it, it seems like Paul has continued the whole time that he's mentored Timothy to picture that out there, right? Picture life ahead. Like, this is where we're going. We want to be completely bloodied and battered and bruised when we pass over from this earth to
to heaven. We don't want to leave anything on the table. Your aim is out there. We said this weekend, if you don't look forward and have thoughts and plans and hopes, it doesn't mean you have to have a bad marriage today. But if you're not looking out there <coughs> saying, Lord, what would you have for us out there? Then your chances of getting somewhere much better than today are a lot less likely. So when you're looking forward with a vision for the future, you have somewhere you're aiming. You're going towards something. If you don't even aim, I mean, where are you going to go? You're just going to kind of exist, right? So this aim on life, I picture him saying, follow me. I've laid out this vision for life, Timothy. Get on board. Like Rachel said, you're getting in the purposes of God and those he's put in front of you, and you're following in that aim of life. So that's the picture of this. And then my other, my other phrase under this, solidify your aim and count the cost, is buckle up buttercup. <laughs> Anybody's grandma, grandma ever use that term? Or did you ever use that term? So buckle up buttercup. All who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. Plan for it. If you expect that it's going to happen, you're going to be a lot less discouraged when it happens. Right? So uh, Kevin's reading a book about emotions right now. And one of the things it talks about is that when we <coughs> predict certain emotions, we're more likely to experience those emotions that we predict. So if I predict that I'm going to be upset and let down on vacation, and most likely our plans are not going to go my way, and most likely this is going to happen, and I'm going to have a lot less enjoyable vacation. Like it's not just, uh, it's not just an anecdotal, anecdotal study either. Like scientifically, there's real evidence that you actually will have a worse time. You, if you expect to recover poorly from a surgery, if you, ex if you are an emotional sick person, like you're miserable and you're griping and you're complaining <coughs> all the time that you're sick, you're more likely to stay sick longer, actually sick longer. Not just like, I think I'm sick, I'm tricking myself, but you're more likely to actually stay sick longer. Because we also trick ourselves that we're sick too with our brains. Our brains are really powerful and it's kind of annoying. Um, so, yeah, so buckle up, plan for the fact that there will be persecution, there will be suffering. If you think that coming to Christ or not coming to Christ, if, if either of those worlds you believe will, will allow you to experience no suffering, your head's in the sand, right? Like, that's not a thing. But if we have to suffer, why not suffer for Christ's sake, right? That's always the idea that Paul's put, put in front of us. Okay, so the last point we want to make is fortify the walls, prepare for the attack. So that's point four. Fortify the walls and prepare for the attack. So we already said we know it's coming. Buckle up. It's coming. So let's fortify our walls for it. Okay, verse 14 says, But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You'll suffer at times, and you'll look up, you'll look down the road, or you'll look across at somebody's social media page, or whatever's going on in their lives. The one who is persecuting you, the one who is bringing suffer, suffering into your life. Here you're suffering, and it looks like they're getting off scot free. <coughs> life is just going along. Everything's fine and dandy, rosy over there. But we've already been told in this previous chapter that they will be found out. It will be made known. So what you have to do is put your eyes on the prize. What you've been given to do at this point, continue and expand upon that. That's what he's saying to Timothy. You've been given the sacred writings. You already know what to do. If you're at a place of indecisiveness and you don't want to know what to do next in life, whether it's through suffering or whatever it is, what was the last thing God revealed to you to do? Continue doing that and expounding upon that until he reveals something else. Don't get sidetracked by what's happening with other people who have brought you harm in the past. Okay, stop looking for the next Christian self-help book. You've been given the sacred writings. He had been given the whole Old Testament. He was not supposed to be going and listening and reading from book to book trying to fix himself or those around him. He needed to stay in the very breath of God, the words of God, the scripture. Um, what does it say it's profitable for? There's four things I see. It says it's profitable. The word of God is profitable. It's breathed out and profitable for what? Teaching, 
training in righteousness. So this training in righteousness, the literal translation is child training. So y'all want a fun word picture? Keep in your mind about what we're supposed to be doing with one, one another in the body of Christ. We're all supposed to be going around spiritually potty training everybody else. <laughs> this is what we're doing. We are all showing each other where the potties are. And if they need a little potty, because they're just getting started, we get them a little potty. Right? And if, if they're, now they've graduated, but they just need somebody to help wipe the bum, <laughs> spiritually speaking, and then they've graduated, and now they're allowed to go in the bathroom by themselves. Right? So exciting when they get to go to the potty by themselves, and you don't have to go with them. Um, well, in public, you're still going to go with them because it's a terrifying world. But anyway, um, so yeah, it's this idea, but does that, now it's going to stick, right? When you think about this, that we're supposed to be child training each other. We are going around saying, come on, sister, like I haven't seen you in two weeks. You haven't been at Bible study. Come to study with me. I'm going to come pick you up. If I see you not here next week, I'm coming to get you. You know, you can just love on people in that way, and we're discipling each other all the time. So teaching reproof means we're, we're, we're calling them out. Correction is more of the sense of we're calling them out, but then we're walking with them, showing them what. We're how, we're, so when your kid does something wrong, but they're not in trouble, you're teaching them, you're correcting them, but you're, you're just showing them how to get it right, how to do it right. Okay, so then what is the purpose of our prophet? So it prophets all of this, and what's the purpose? The Lord doesn't just give us this prophet for self, right? For self-glorification or edification. He, it's, he gives it to us so that we'll be complete, and that will be equipped. So completion here is capable, proficient, able to meet all the demands. So if you're proficient in your job, you've been equipped with everything you need to get the job done. So it doesn't matter if you've been a believer for one year or 72 years. Whatever God's calling you to do today, he has already fully equipped you with that through his word. Paul has total confidence here in the knowledge of the scriptures that Timothy already has. He has confidence that Timothy will continue in that, continue to learn uh, through the scriptures. But more so, he has confidence that the word of God is able to fully supply everything Timothy do needs to do this work. The last thing I want to say, I was hoping Dee Dee Clay was going to be here, but I think she's on vacation too. Hannah has always been big time vacationers at the fall. It's really weird. Everybody travels all fall. No other church that we've been at does that. But I guess you're, no, but you're not all old, old anymore. We have a lot of young families. Okay, but like camping. A lot of our families go camping. And some of them group together and go camping for a weekend. So you have like a section of the church camping that weekend. Okay, which is great. I'm not, I'm not talking that. No one's in trouble. Okay, so... Dee Dee told me a story a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, about, I think it, well, I won't say any names. So someone said to her about her life, um, I just feel like you've been so different. And so Dee Dee, should, they knew Dee Dee had been going to church and stuff like that, but because they don't know Christ, they don't really get why that would matter, right? Because if they've gone to a church that is kind of void of the gospel and void of power, then they don't know that that's, that's why you would be seeming so different. Right, but many of you know Dee Dee was baptized here within the last year, I think. Um, so she's a new believer. She's just starting out at a much older age, right? So she told them, I don't, it's Jesus. Like, I've committed my life to Christ, and the more I study the scripture, the happier I get. The more I go to church, the happier I get. And she travels a lot right now because she's recently retired, but then she's just really ready to get back to that happiness of being with the body of Christ. So on that note, I want to read to you this section from um, Matthew Henry, a commentator, on 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, and then I'll let you go. And it's a, so it's about this very passage with the breath of God, the words of God being breathed out, which, by the way, is literally, literally translated inspired. And so that's what, if you hear us talk about God's word being inspired, this is part of the t one of the texts that that comes out of. Okay. There is no occasion for the writing of the philosopher, nor for, rab for rabbinical fables, nor popish legends, nor unwritten traditions to make us perfect people of God, since the scripture answers all these ends and purposes already. Oh, that we may love our Bibles more and more. Keep them closer to us than they have ever been. Then shall we find the benefit and advantage designed thereby, and shall at last attain the happiness therein, promised and assured to us. Don't go look for a speaker. Don't go constantly searching for the greatest pastors to read from. Don't just look up your favorite <coughs> authors. Love your Bible. 
is breathed out by God. How could we get any better than the sacred writings? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this opportunity to open your word. We ask that you would continue to make it not return void in our lives, that we would apply it day after day and year after year, God. We lift up every family that's represented in this room tonight and those who are not here tonight, God, and we ask that you would continue to make them a faithful generation, that they may be able to pass down your sacred teachings to the next generation. Father, we pray that you would rise up many among us to continue to serve you in greater capacity and greater ways, but that you would build our congregation through salvation and through new believers, Father, not just from church, uh, you know, transitions. So those are great, too, if they're of you, Father, but we just want to see your hand use our work and our efforts to bring glory to yourself. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen.